Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine, and thank you for listening to the Captain's Collective. This episode is brought to you by Don's Bait and Tackle Shop, located in Homestead, Florida. Don's is a family-owned and operated business that's been serving anglers in South Florida in the Everglades for 60 years. They have great gear and live bait and are well worth the stop the next time that you're in South Florida. On top of that, they really care about the fishing community and local fisheries, and we are grateful for their support with making this podcast happen. It means a lot to a bunch of young guys like us with limited resources who are really trying to make a go at gathering the best content we can from captains and other industry leaders. As we tell ourselves all the time on our trips, these are the good old days, and we're grateful for everyone who's helping make it happen. In today's episode, we sit down with Rob Fordyce from the television show The Sea Hunter, and talk about his story, which includes a rather fortunate bump in he had at 10 years old with a store owner who would become a lifelong mentor named Flip Pallet. We also talk about his history as a guide and tournament angler. Rob plays in over 130 tournaments across the globe. We also talk a bit about fitness, his television show, The Sea Hunter, which focuses on a wide variety of species. And we also have an incredible section on targeting tarpon and Rob's take on the tarpon migration, or as he would put it, migrations. We hope that you enjoy this episode. Please continue to support and share. This is The Captain's Collective. Success is a gift. Excellence is the only thing to strive for. He tried to eat it. He tried to eat it. Hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him. You got him. He's on. Go two butt caps off the rods, filled them with tequila. We took a shot and out we went. There, there ain't no getting into it after that. It's, you're, you're hooked. It's a bad habit. And all the time flips, the, he's standing there ready to go for a tarpon. And he turned around, he says, you talk so much, you're like a senator. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. We're, we really appreciate you giving us some time today just to sit down and talk about fishing and uh, pick your brain a little bit about tarpon and a few other species. Do you mind just giving us a little bit of a introduction to how you got introduced to fishing and how it all really began for you? Yeah, you know, actually, I, I, I got pretty into fishing. My grandfather was a big fisherman. He wasn't a fly fisherman, but he, he loved to fish, bass fish. He had a uh, place in Key Largo. We'd, we'd go grouper fishing off the reef, so forth, so on. Every every uh, Thanksgiving, my my family vacation was to go up to Lake Okeechobee and duck hunt, but we'd go a week early, and we'd bass fish for a week, and then we'd duck hunt when the season opened. So I'm mean, I mean early in my days, five, six years old. And when we weren't out on the lake uh, hunting or, or bass fishing, I was at the dock chasing little bluegills and bass and and, you know, usually little kids don't have patience. They, they get kind of bored. I could stay out there all day. So I had, it was obvious to my, to my parents that I, I was pretty, you know, obsessed with, with fishing, with the outdoors in general. I love to hunt as well. But it, early on, um, I, I had the passion for fishing. For my eighth birthday, my dad took me uh, with a, a famous bonefish guy named Bill Curtis. Not to really go fishing, but to teach me how to fly cast. I, earlier in that year, leading up to my eighth birthday, I went out in the Everglades with my uncle. We were rowing down a canal. He was taking me to some bass spot. We were in a canoe. He had an old fly rod that he built in, in shop class, fiberglass piece of junk, but it had a little bass bug on it. He said, pick that up while I'm rowing us down this canal and just flip it over to the lily pads. Yeah, I never fly fished. I'd, I'd seen it. So I did that. I could, you know, basically flip the leader out. I didn't have to make a long cast. And I started catching one little bass after another and panfish. And I just got enamored with fly fishing from that point forward. My grandfather had given me a book called The World Fishing Encyclopedia. And it was about four inches thick, black and white, uh, written in the 50s and 60s. And it had everything from catching rainbow trout to giant black marlin. And in the middle of the book, there was a little fly tying deal. So I went home and I, and I looked up fly fishing in that, in that encyclopedia and I went out to my dad's shop and he had a, just a, a vice, not, not a, I mean a vice like you use for mechanic stuff, like you'd put a giant <laughs> bolt into. I put a hook in there and took some thread out of my mom's sewing kit and made a fly. It was very 
you know, wasn't much of a fly, but that was kind of the beginning of, of this whole thing that a lifelong passion for fly fishing. So to go back to the eighth birthday, I, I went out with this guide and he, he, he had me, me casting in about an hour. And then in about an hour later, he had me double hauling. You know, I just picked it up quick. And, um, later that day I caught my first bonefish. So from that point on, it was, it was on and it didn't take too much longer that I, that I developed this passion for tarpon. Um, when I was, when I was 12 years old, my dad said, if you catch one over a hundred pounds on fly, I'll mount it for you. And I was friends with, we had become friends with a guy named Al Fluger, Fluger taxidermy. He says, all you gotta do is do a tape, you know, length and girth, and we can make you a replica of that fish so you can, so you can let it go. I hooked, I don't know how many fish that were that size and they got off one way or another, you know, whether it was a poor leader tide or, or just bad luck or me not knowing how to pull on them, whatever. But on August 13th, 1982, I caught a tarpon that taped out 147 pounds on the fly rod. And you got it mounted? Yep. <laughs> where, where do you have that hanging today? You know what? Hurricane Andrew actually destroyed that mount, unfortunately. Oh, really? Yeah. Man. Yeah, I've thought about getting it replaced, but I've you know, I've caught I've caught fish much much bigger than that since. So I I remember it. It was a cool moment in my life and it changed my life, you know, catching that fish. So And you talk about going out and learning with Bill how to fly cast. Who were some of the people who kind of shaped you as a fisherman as you grew up and became more advanced? I, I, I was I was very fortunate. Um, along the same time frame uh, that I had gone with Bill, about two years after that, I had fly. I would come home from school and I would go practice. My dad bought me a, a pretty nice fly rod, and I'd be out in my yard picking targets, just just casting. I had a nine weight and a 12 weight and 12 weights in that, in that time frame were literally three times heavier than they are now, as far as the weight of the rod. So I was in a tie and flies and, and there was a store in Miami called wind river rendezvous and a guy named flip pallet owned that store. It was, it was before he actually guided or had a TV show or any of that, but I knew who flip pallet was. I'd seen him on a, on a show called outdoor life and the American sportsman. And it was the only store in Miami that you could get good fly tying material. So I'm, I'm in a store, I'm this 10 year old kid kneeling down, looking at, at feathers for tarpon flies and these boots appear in front of me. I look up and it's flip and I'm like, Holy, you know, it's flip pallet. And I guess it's not every day you see a little kid looking at fly tying material. So he goes, what are you doing? I go, well, I'm looking for this particular kind of feather for a tarpon fly. And I guess that kind of sparked his interest into who I was and what I was about as a little kid doing, you know, in, interested in this. So shortly thereafter, Sage came out with the first graphite fly rods. They made a nine weight and a 12 weight. He invited me to come to the store, go out in the parking lot and cast. He goes, I'll give you a casting lesson. We'll try these new rods out. Man, I was so excited. This guy was like a hero to me. We go out and he cast a rod and he handed me the nine weight and I cast it. And then we traded to 12 weight and I cast it and I go, so you know, help me out here. What am I doing wrong? He goes, I can't fix a damn thing. Let's go fishing. <laughs> Man. So from that point forward, he and I crea created this friendship and it was never, you know, there's an age difference there. I actually was just in Titusville this past week filming with flip and we reminisced and we spend approximately 40 days together a year hunting and have for, I don't know how many years, but we've had a 40 year relationship. And when he lived in South Florida, we would, we would spend probably 100 days together a year, whether it be hunting or fishing. So I would say that, that Flip had a big hand in, in shaping my earlier you know, career, and so did Al Fluger, because I spent a lot of time with him as well. One of the best all-around fishermen I've ever been with, you know, spin, casting, fly rod, whatever. But you know, I think one of the things that has led to a successful 30-year professional career for me is never being satisfied with my knowledge of the game, regardless of the, of the species. You know, I, I definitely have a, a high skill level and a, and a developed passion for, for big tarpon, especially fly fishing for them. But I love to fish for everything. You know, I, I, I'd love to go out and put the kite up and catch a sailfish or go way, way back in the backcountry and, and, and look for snook. So... Every day I get up still today, I, I don't 
get up with this mindset that I know how to do this and that, um, you know, I, I, I'm, the, I'm the best at it or anything like that. I'm always trying to succeed and learn and try new techniques every day I'm on the water. And I think that's what's been the, the leading uh, drive behind me being successful and where I'm, where I'm at now. That's been one of the common themes that we've seen as we've began this podcast is you have people who fall in love with fishing, some younger than others. And, you know, you're young and you're learning everything. And there's a lot of people with a lot of different topics and things in life where they do that and it plateaus out and yeah. they get established. Mm -hmm. But as we meet different guides, we've noticed a common thread of a childlike obsession or passion or love with fishing yep. that you can tell they, they just want to learn and keep doing it again and again and again. And like the, the story you told about you being a kid with the bluegill, you know, you right. never really grow out of that. That's right. And, and you mentioned tarpon fishing and, you know, we wanted to hop in it quick, but you wrote a book on tarpon fishing. Where, I, I where did. did the inspiration for that come from? Actually for years, uh, for about 20 years, I fished this guy named Donald Larmouth. He was, uh, uh, late in his career. He was the Dean of university of Wisconsin, but he was a linguistics uh, professor before that. And um, this guy would come and, and fish with me three times a year for five to seven days at a pop. So, you know, we were spending quite a bit of time together over 20 years. And about 18 years into it, he goes, you know, we should, you should write a book on, I said, Donald, you know, I'm fishing 280, 300 days a year. I'm, I'm not the best guy at writing. You know, I, I can convey a message, but. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a writer. He goes, well, why don't we do this? As we drive back, we, we fish Flamingo a lot. As we drive back and forth every day when we're fishing, I'll just record. I'll ask you questions and how-to questions about techniques and stuff with fly fishing for tarpon, and I'll record them, and I'll I'll jot this stuff down and, and send you a rough rough draft, and you, you correct anything that's not right. During the same phase, he kept a journal of every one of our fishing excursions. So I don't know if you've seen the book or not. It's called Tarpon on Fly. I did all the how-to technique, technical stuff, but each chapter begins with a, an, an actual experience that he and I shared together. And he, he, he jotted these things down for his dad who loved to fish, but, but physically was unable to anymore. So he would take his journal home and let his dad read it so he could kind of relive the experience. Wow. So that's how the book really came to be. And, um, one thing led to another and in, uh, over about two and a half years, the book came to life. Yeah. That's an incredible piece to that because when you look at it and you see that aspect of it to hear how personal that element of the book is, is pretty neat. Yeah. It's pretty powerful. I, I'm not sure that many books are written that way, but this one was pretty legit. Yeah. And, and really for you, when, when was that in your career? When you, when you wrote that book? I want to say we, we finished that book around 2001 2002 was about the time it was it was done so how long had you been guiding up until that point uh, my my first year of guiding was well my first official year i actually guided when i was in high school i i didn't have a license i would take you know extra guys when when flip flip mm -hmm. was guiding at that time when i was in high school he'd have some extra guys or had a doctor's appointment i'd take his guys when i wasn't in school uh, but officially, my my first year of guiding was 1989. My first tarpon season was actually 1990. Okay. And that was actually the first year I fished a tarpon tournament as a guide. I fished the Holly tournament. So you got, you jumped right into the tournament, tournament I did. fishing. And lo and behold, this is kind of an interesting story, my first tarpon tournament as a guide, how it came to be. This guy calls Flip from the Keys. He was a, a Keys local angler called Flip and asked Flip to fish him in, in the Holly tournament. And Flip says, you know, I don't do tournaments anymore, but there's a young friend of mine that, that's in, you know, just started guiding and I'm sure he'd be willing to fish you in it. And this guy books me for the tournament and books me a bunch of practice days. And the keys was different then, you know, there, there were, especially in Isla Mirada, it was a close knit bunch of guides that loved or hated each other, but outsiders were not welcome here. When I mean outsiders, I mean anybody outside of Isla Mirada, much <laughs> less the Keys. So me being a, a Miami home slash homestead boy, you know, I wasn't embraced with open arms. And um, so this guy books me, and about 
three weeks before the tournament, right before our practice day started, he calls me and says, I can't fish you in the tournament. He goes, I'm getting too much grief from the local guides. I live here. You know, I can't go to a restaurant without one of these guides coming over saying, hey, I hear you're fishing with some outsider, so forth, so on. Well, that infuriated me, you know, that, that one, the guy, he, he didn't make good on his days either. He didn't pay me for the days and booking me way in advance and then and canceling me. So the next day I'm, I'm fishing these two guys from Dallas, and I tell them this story. You know, I'm kind of irritated with the whole thing. One of them's a plastic surgeon, and the other guy was a famous bass bug fly tire named Jimmy Nix. The, the surgeon goes to Jimmy. He goes, why don't you fish with Rob in the tournament if there's still an opening? And Jimmy's like, I can't afford to do that. He goes, I'll pay for it. He goes, and I said, I'll fish you for free. All I wanted to do was beat this guy that canceled me. I didn't care about <laughs> winning the tournament. It was, you know. So one thing led to another. We fished the tournament, and damn if we didn't win a thing. Oh, my goodness. I, my first tarpon tournament. <laughs> Man, how old were you when that happened? I was uh, 19. And, and since then, what's your, your tournament life been like? I know a decent bit about it, but. Um, the, the tournament, when I was a younger guide, I, I was a little more high strung than I am now. I've always been competitive, and I think it comes from being in, in, big in sports, you know, as a, as a youngster growing up. I went to University of Tennessee on a baseball scholarship. Unfortunately, that was ended early because of torn rotator cuff, multiple surgeries and so forth. But I've always been very competitive. And I don't think that you can compare yourself to you, – you, you have to, to compete to know where you stand in the game, regardless of the game. It doesn't matter whether you're a Wall Street guy or whether you're, you know, a baseball player or a quarterback. You don't know how good you are until you compete against other guys that are doing the same thing. So I've always been very competitive. I'm still competitive in my life between the Gold Cup, the Holly, the women's, which used to be a giant tournament. It's, it's coming back now. And the Golden Fly Tournament. I've fished 61 tournaments. Wow. Just fly, fly tarpon tournaments. And I've won 14 of them. But what I'm most proud of is out of that 61 tournaments, I've come in first, second, or third in 52 of them. Wow. And that's not bragging. That's just a fact that, you know, I could have stopped once I won, them, won, won all three of them, which was the first three years I guided. The Golden Fly didn't exist then. I was the first guide to win, win all three. I, I could have stopped there, and, and most guides would have said, that's, that's a great career. You know, no one's done that before. You're the first guy to do that and so forth. But it just, it's just something that's in me. I love, I love that competition. I love to compare myself. And I'm really, I'm not competing against everybody else. I'm competing against myself to that's see if show. I still got it. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about now, in this point in my career. I got nothing to prove. I want to see if I can still, can still do it. And last year, uh, I fished a guy in the holly, and we, and we won that. So until, until I feel like I don't have it anymore, until I, I feel like, I don't have a chance when I leave the dock to win. I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. So, so a couple of questions feeding off of that. Um, one, have you ever, have you always fished tournaments? Have you, have you always been the guide or have you ever been an angler? Fly tarpon tournaments. I fished one as an angler and it was my high school graduation present and it was the Holly awesome. tournament. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I fished with a guy, a very good friend of mine, Paul Tahera. It was young in his guiding career. And, uh, we, we came in, we came in third but it was it was cool. That was kind of the beginning of my drive to to want to to really be a guide. You know, I always knew I wanted to fish, mm -hmm. but being around these guys that I read stories about and and being in in that competitive environment and and seeing how these guides were, were really there were icons in the in the business at the time. You know, fly fishing for tarpon hasn't existed a very long time. It's it's only a, a 40, 50 year old real sport, you know, where there was more than one or two guys doing it. And the cool thing about Alamorada is the first actually recorded tarp, big tarpon ever caught landed on a fly rod was in Alamorada on the Bayside back in the back in the twenties, you know, early nineteen hundreds. So to to be around these guys that kind of developed the sport and made it made it something that was was what it has become and competing against these guys just 
kind of even seeded that desire to be one of those guys one day even more. I love hearing stories from them. So far, we've done Harry Spear and Nat Raglan. Mm -hmm. You know Nat. Nat's a great guy. Yeah. Very good friend. And uh, just incredible to hear about really how it all began and how it kind of evolved into what it is today and the tournaments and the guiding. And yeah. For you, one of the things I was curious about was obviously you take fishing seriously and you bring an intensity to it, but is there a different mindset or approach when you're doing tournament fishing than when you're taking out a client or doing television? I, I would, that's a great question because I think if you asked a hundred guides that same question, probably 90 of them would say, Oh yeah, there's a big difference. I would, I would disagree. You know, I, I think you practice like you play. And um, going back to, you know, never being satisfied with my knowledge of the game, I, I've never fished. Yeah, if I take a little kid, you know, the, out fishing, I'm, there's no pressure involved and I'm not trying to. But w when it comes to fly fishing for tarpon, every day I do it, it's a competition to me. It's a competition between me and the tarpon. And it's a competition between me and, and every guide fishing that day for tarpon. And I think that in itself, having that mindset and, and, and trying your hardest every day, trying different flies, no matter how tired you are, coming home and tying a new fly to see if the fish will eat it. And do, you know, multiply that over hundreds of days, over 30 years. That's a lot of information that gets stored and gets built up. So to me, it's not a difference. Other types of fishing might be a little more laid back for me, but fly fishing for tarpon, I take pretty damn serious. I don't mean that I'm, I'm super intense and we don't laugh and we don't joke around and have a good time. Absolutely. It's, it's part of it. And guiding is an entertainment sport. You know, it's, you're in the entertainment business. A guy comes down here, he's paying you a lot of money. You got to have fun. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, at the end of the day, he's going to say that guy tried his ass off to get me a tarpon. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is there a way that you, as you talked about kind of gathering knowledge together, and this is a question we've started to ask more and more, is there a way that you kind of try to take all that information and place it together? Do you keep a written journal? I, I used to. I used to keep a very elaborate journal, and, and you know, I kicked myself in the, in the butt for not having done it my whole career. But certainly the first 10, 12 years, of, of going back even, even before I guided, I did it even more once I started guiding. Because once I started guiding, I was on the water every day and I'm, I'm kind of getting a feel for how the fishery's changing day to day with weather changes and so forth. But early in my career, I, I kept it a, an elaborate journal of tides, wind direction, barometer, you know, a particular flat. And I, I would name places that, that I named, you know, not that were local names. Mm. So I knew exactly, you know, where, where I was talking about when I would reread it. And absolutely for anyone, guide or, or, or weekender, it, it's an important part of the game because you'll start to see, you know, characteristics of, of wind and barometer and tides and conditions that, that make sense. You, you'll start seeing patterns, you know. So feeding off of that, um, I've been asking this question too for a lot of the tarpon guys. Uh, everybody you ask pretty much has a different idea of how these fish are migrating. Some people think they're just running right up the coast. Mm-hmm. Some people kind of have a theory that they're all pushing in kind of north and east and then moving west kind of from offshore because, you know, you guys will start seeing fish around March, April, right? Migratory fish. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? You know, it depends where you're at. On, on, the, on the Atlantic side, uh, let me back up a little bit. I think, to me, I don't think there is a tarpon migration. I think there are tarpon migrations plural and and i think there's this there are certain bodies of fish whether it be ten thousand fish or whether it be a thousand fish that come from different places but they all end up here in the keys regardless of where they're coming from at some point to to ming they all meet here in may, you know may early june to stage to go offshore and spawn so i think you have atlantic fish which is the largest number of tarpon that we have here I think it's it's the it's the the healthiest stock. It's it's the most abundant amount of fish that we get that come down the Atlantic, and in the early spring when the weather warms enough on the flats, the you know the waters in the mid seven early you know low to mid seventies, these fish 
migrate right down the coast. At the same time, you have this body of fish that's coming down the Gulf from the Panhandle, from Louisiana, wherever they originate from, that are all coming here and they're all going to stage together. They're all going to meet, you know, in these, these big channels and bridges. And once the moon's right, they go offshore and do their thing. So depending on where you're at and, and the time of year, you can find bodies of fish in different places on different time, times. Like right now, we're, we're getting huge migratory fish in the Everglades. Those are the same fish that end up here in another couple of months to go offshore and spawn. And most of them are big, giant, you know, female fish that obviously just are laid, part of the deal. Just laid up up in there. I think they go up there. And, you know, I've heard from biologists, and I, I don't have factual data on this, nor, nor do they at this point. But it's been, it's been told to me that Gulf tarpon, not Atlantic tarpon, but Gulf tarpon need fresh water to trigger their spawning mechanism in their body. So that makes total sense to me to, to, to go to Whitewater Bay this time of year and there's a few thousand fish in there laid up, just staging, kind of soaking this fresh water up and staying warm you know, through the cold part of the, the early spring and late winter before, before the conditions get right for them to end up here and m- mingle with the Atlantic fish to go offshore. Do you kind of have a different approach throughout the different seasons and stages with those types of fish? Well, you know, each, each fishery... Uh, usually in most situations, the fish are doing different things. So you approach them differently. You know, um, if, if we're, if I was going to go to whitewater Bay tomorrow and tarpon fish, I'm looking in these big lakes where these fish are just laid up, moving very slowly, very stealthily two, three months from now, when I'm looking for fish migrating down the ocean, I'll go sit on a, on a, on an ocean, on an ocean, uh, side flat near a big channel, a big reservoir. I call channels reservoirs because that's where the fish are. They're just using the flats as highways. They're not traveling these flats to go eat something. They're just moving from A to B. And you sit there on a, on a particular big part of the tide and see if they're coming. And if they're not, then you move south or north. You know, pick another reservoir. So there are different approaches, you know, to different fish, whether it be ocean fish or backcountry fish. There's definitely a huge technical differential. You know, in the backcountry, we throw much bigger flies. Those fish are, tend to eat better, now, even though they're not really there to eat. They, they, they come across, I think, bait uh, less frequently. Like the Atlantic fish lay in the channels all night and, and gorge themselves. And then when you're throwing at them on the flats, they're not eating. They're not in that mode. They've been eating all night. So now they're just traveling. The fish in the backcountry... They're, they're more spontaneous. You know, if something swims in front of them, they, they bite More it. opportunistic. Yes, correct. So that in itself is a different game. You know, you can throw the fly closer, the water's dirtier, bigger flies. You can see the fly easy. You can, you know, get the fly in the zone of awareness, I call it, which is that zone where the fish senses the fly and they eat it. Ocean fish, because they're not in an eating mode, you throw a big fly in there and they get offended by it. They've been fished so often so many times over and over again, they know this big thing moving through them is not a good thing. And, th- and they're totally not in that mode. It's like you just ate a pizza and you're trying to sit there and digest it and somebody puts another pizza down in front of you. You, don't, you just push it away. You don't want anything to do with it. So you have to create this cat and mouse game that you get a reaction bite out of those fish because they're not in an eating mode. Little flies on the ocean, they allow it to be in amongst them. They don't, they're, not, they're not offended by it. So you throw these tiny little flies that you can barely see, but they can see them. And if you strip it right and it crosses that fish's area of awareness, it's just a reaction. He can't help himself. So it's just kind of something, you know, it's not going to take that fish enough calories. It's not going to be wasting calories to go eat right. eat that fly. It's, you know, just cross her path and bring it through that path as long as you can. Right. Correct. And allow that fish to just come up and eat. And fish as many fish in the bunch right. as you can at a good angle. That's, that's the whole trick to ocean fishing is, I think, you know, if you have a string of 10 fish coming at you and you, you try to fish them, you know, at an angle that the fly is coming away from them. So the first cat, many people set the boat up where the fish run into the boat so they get a head-on shot. Problem with a head-on shot on the ocean is... If, if, he does, if the first fish doesn't eat the fly, or the second one, the fish hit the boat, the shot's over because hmm. they're spooked. 
you set them up where it's a 10 o'clock shot where they're going to clear the bow. So your first cast is still coming away from number one or two or three. You can pick up, stay at that same 10 o'clock angle and throw it over the back of number four and fish five and six. Mm. Pick up and throw it over the back of number eight and fish nine and 10. You, you keep fishing at that good angle where most people make the mistake is they throw at the lead fish on that 10 o'clock shot. He doesn't eat. They pick up and now they make a cast at 12. The angle's worse and you're fishing a fish that you already fished at a better angle that didn't eat. Hmm. So you keep, you, you were actually picking, even in schools of 50, 60 fish, we're picking particular fish that are at the right angle that you can present the fly to without spooking the rest of them. And you keep fishing that angle until you're out of fish. And then you pick up and change your angle. So when you say you're picking a particular fish out of that string, are you looking for something the way they're swimming? Are they a little bit higher maybe yes, in the water yes. column? Just a little bit more happy? Absolutely. You're, you're looking for fish that are the highest in the water column that you can get the fly in front of and intercept mm -hmm. without spooking the rest of them. And that's one thing that modern day fly lines have, have helped. You know, we, in the old days, we didn't have clear floating fly lines. So the, the fly line cast a shadow. I still use colored lines, you know, when the wind's blowing, but when it's, when it's 10 knots or less, we're using clear lines. Mm -hmm. It allows you to throw much closer to the fish without them sensing the landing of the fly line. Just all these, all these little things add up to success. Long leaders, long stealthy leaders, small flies. As soon as the fly hits the water, it better be moving. It can't sink. You know, all these things add up to, it's, it's kind of an equation. You do this, 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 and this, and it adds up to success. If you miss one of those, it drops your odds 30%. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things when we were sitting down with Harry, he talked about what makes a great tournament fisherman, but he said this makes a great guide too. He said it's kind of like a pie. You got all these slices on the pie of all these factors and equations and things. Mm -hmm. And he said, usually what sets apart good tournament fishermen from great tournament fishermen is not the necessarily the biggest slice of the pie, but the fact that they have all those little ones Absolutely. tied down. Yeah, I don't believe it. I don't believe uh, in luck. I've never been a lucky guy. So the more things you can do to narrow down the luck factor, whether whether it's from practicing your casting to tying your leaders right to sharpening your hooks, you know, mo most guides in today's world don't sharpen their hooks because the hooks are so much better right out of the box. Mm -hmm. There isn't a, there isn't a hook made still today that's sharp enough to to hook a tarpon, in my opinion. Hmm. You, yep. Now I've never sharpened a hook. Can you walk us through that? I, I, Is there a certain tool I, or something you sharpen them with? Just yes, a file. A file. Okay. A, a good bona fide, you know, lure Jensen yellow handled file. Mm -hmm. it, it's aggressive, but not too aggressive. And you know, tarpon. It's no. It's no mystery that tarpon have the boniest mouth of any fish we fish it's for. It's like a wet center block. Yeah, and <laughs> um, the problem with most hooks are the point, the, the distance between the end of the point and, and the barb is too long. Also, the point is too thin. So often you'll come back after hooking a tarpon and he jumps off and the point is actually curled from hitting that bone. So I take away some of that material. I, I make the point one, the distance between the point and the, and the barb, mm -hmm. it's less, you know, it's maybe half the distance that it comes out of the box. But two, I make it bladed. I actually triangulate the hook. I turn it upside down. I do an angle until I get about the right amount of material gone off mm -hmm. the point. And then I then I'll turn it over and go on the other side of the point. Always sharp. This is very, this is a key. Pushing the file towards the point, hmm. not with the point. Because hmm. when you go with the point, it makes the point very thin, mm -hmm. and it'll it'll go right back to curling when it hits the hard hard stuff. Is there a certain hook that you feel like sharpens best? All, all, all of the hooks really today are, are pretty darn good steel, mm -hmm. you know. Um, steel hooks tend to sharpen better than stainless steel hooks. And, if, and when you break fish off, they rust out much faster than mm -hmm. a stainless hook. Stainless tends to be a little softer. The steel is, is a little more type brittle. So you, you can get that thing honed in. It, it rusts pretty quickly by the end of the day if, if you sharpen it and take that finish off mm -hmm. it'll rust so you got to wash it off or retouch it up the next day you know with the file to get that rust off but definitely a steel hook gets sharper than a than a stainless hook and you talked about long lengthy leaders how long are you talking 
Uh, the normal tarpon leader for me is a 12 foot leader. Mm -hmm. On calm days, we'll go 13, 14 feet, mm. maybe even 15 sometimes if it's super calm. And we'll drop down in weight of a fly, you know, of, of, of fly, um, fly lines. So windy day, we'll throw 11 and 12 weights. Medium wind, 11 weights. No wind, we're throwing 10 weights, even for big fish. The impact on the water of, of a 10 weight fly line versus a 12 weight is there's a tremendous difference there. It's a it's over a hundred grains difference in weight mm -hmm. in the in the two fly lines. So all those little things add up to again the yep. equation. Which me and you probably wouldn't notice it, but a dinosaur tarpon that's they, been they, around forever. They that's been fished ten thousand yeah. times. Mm -hmm. You know that's that's the deal. These fish are so old. We're we're catching fish and we see fish each year that have you know, funny markings, though we see thousands of them, we'll see, man, I saw that fish last year. I saw <laughs> that fish la the year before that. Mm -hmm. You see the same fish. So there, there's no, there's not a new hundred pound strain of tarpon you coming down. You start naming those fish? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we do have some names for some of the. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we were out with uh, Bo yesterday for a little bit. We did a podcast with him and then we were out on the boat and he was pulling us around. And he was, I mean, he spoke really high of your book and he said, that's man, that's the Tarpon Bible. And he said, he must have read that thing 14, 15, 16 times, spoke, spoke really highly. And one of the things he was, he was pulling us around and he was like, man, you, you, you should just see the way Rob pulls. He goes, he just makes that boat just move and fly to get set up on a tarpon. But, um, it, but you know, when, when you talk about the, the, all the little factors, what are some of the factors with trying to pull and get set up on a tarpon? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's, it's great to be able to be in physical shape enough to, to be able to put the boat on a plane, you know, and haul ass and, and intercept fish that are, that are going to get by you if you can't do that. But there's also a lot to be said for, as you start getting in to the zone where you're about to make the shot, you got to, everything's got to be slowing down. The boat can't be moving when the guy's stripping or what he's doing is not happening on, on, on the fly, fly end of the, of the line. You know what I mean? If the boat's going at the fish while he's trying to strip the fly away from the fish, all you're doing is taking up the slack. So there's this crucial moment when you begin a shot that the boat has to stop so that when this guy presents a fly and he starts stripping that what he's doing with his stripping hand is happening on, on the fly end of it. So, Depending on the situation and the wind conditions and, and, and so forth and the tide, you, you pull fast enough to, to intercept the fish and give you that great 10 o'clock shot. But as you, once, you, once you realize you're going you're gonna to get there in time, you really need to slow down so the boat's not, making, not crashing, the boat's not making a lot of noise. When you get into a, ba a bathtub, the water rises from the displacement. Well, there's this ring of awareness that, that is around the boat that the same thing happens, and the fish feel that. And, and the, the more sensitive the fish, the more they feel, the further away they feel that stuff. So ocean fish, especially, when they hear the crash of a bow and a wave, you can see them just go, go deeper in the water column. The chance of you getting a bite out of that bunch is slim. So that's the time that you really got to pay attention to the boat noise, how, how the boat is traveling through the sea, so to speak. Now, do you ever, do you ever anchor up on these ocean fish and then kind of release them and if you have to move, move to them. That's in our area. That's a lot. It's a lot of anchoring and, mm -hmm. you know, just waiting on them. M most guys do anchor on the ocean. I, I'm not a, an anchor fan. The only time I anchor is if it's blowing 20 or more. Really the rest cool. of the time, I'll just hold the boat into the wind mm -hmm. in, in the, in the zone where I think the fish are going to travel. And no matter what, no matter how good they travel down this edge, you're going to have to push in or out. Mm -hmm. So that's, the, the, the time it takes to unclip and push out, that's time lost. That's time wasted to give you that perfect 10 o'clock shot. So I don't anchor often unless the, the conditions act absolutely make you. I mean, physically, you can't hold the boat in 20 knots of wind for six hours. Right. You just can't do it. So we'll anchor. we got a quick release clip with a float. Have the angler. My anglers are pretty dialed in. We've done it for years together. Fish coming. They unclip. Even if the fish are coming no. right at us, we still unclip. That's that uh, quick release. You just pull the little separate line, or you? I'm old. I'm old. I'm old. I'm old school. I just have a, a quick release clip. Okay. Yeah, an actual just clip that, that's right on the bow. Mm -hmm. Has I have a little ring eye on the bow that it clips into. Angler just reaches down, unclips, unclips it, and tosses it. it. Okay. Yeah. 
and obviously one of the things that's really fun about tarpon fishing is it's a team sport. You know, you got the, the guy pulling and you got the guy casting, you're trying to work together. Do you have any tips on that dynamic and how you try to set that up to be successful? Absolutely. There's, there's, there's several things. I mean, it, it's, it, it's like a, a maestro, you know, trying to, to engage in a symphony. You know, he's trying to, to get everybody hit, to hit their notes at the right time. Two things that you can't do. One is you can't start yelling because the guy gets anxious. The anglers get, he's already, he's already nervous because he sees these giant fish coming and he knows he's got to make a great cast or nothing's going to happen. So he's already got that on his own without you adding to that anxiousness by yelling. So you, you have to talk kind of monotone, you know, your, your voice has to kind of stay the same, but at the same time, you're, you're, there's haste involved. I mean, you got to get this done quickly. You're, you're probably feeling a little anxious too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you, you got to keep calm and talk to him in a calm manner, but you have to be very direct. So, I mean, a normal tarpon shot would, for me would most of the time, you know, the guide sees the, the, the fish first just because he's higher usually and he's used to doing it every day. You know, point your rod at 10 o'clock. Little left, 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 left. Now, I'm by, by me telling him to point his rod, I know where he's looking. Mm -hmm. It gives me a reference point to where he's, he's actually engaged. So left, 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 right there, 100 feet coming. You got him? I got him. Okay, start casting. Mm -hmm. And as he's casting, I'm seeing his, his fly line travel through the air in reference to the school of fish. At the same time, I'm watching the fish to see which fish is probably going to be the most likely to bite because of where he's traveling, mm -hmm. high in the water column. He looks happy. He's dark. His body is dark. Mm -hmm. Fish that, that, that tend to show up appear darker in the water, more lit up, so to mm -hmm. speak, tend to bite better. All those little things. So I'm leading, you know, right, 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 right. Shoot that a little bit or drop it, mm -hmm. leave it, leave it, leave it, strip it, strip, strip, leave it, strip it, leave it, leave it, strip, 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 mm -hmm. hit them. Mm. Then game yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> What are some, we like to talk with guides too about what are some mistakes that you see young guides making, or maybe not even young guides making, but some common mistakes that guides tend to make? Yeah, well, it goes back to, you know, trying to position the boat to fish for one, um, giving the angler a more difficult shot than you had time to set them up for would be one. Two, pulling fast after fish, and when once he does start to cast, the boat's still drifting, so the fly is not getting strip through the water correctly. Those are, those are common mistakes. Um, not slowing the boat down as you approach fish. So it, the boat's crashing. So they sense your awareness before the fly even gets in the, in them. Th those are common things that are, that are, that are made. Another is once a fish to a fish is hooked. Often a guide thinks, uh, his job's over, you know, yeah, he'll get down and he'll crank the motor and chase the fish, but no, it, there's a whole nother thing about setup there to beat this fish quickly, always trying to stay close to the fish and behind the fish, you know, and, and taking the boat out of gear, letting, letting the, the guy really pull on them. When the fly line starts to leave, you idle back up, get half the fly line back on. The fact of you see a lot of guys more than, more than not just hook a fish. They jump down, they follow the fish and it's like walking a dog in the park. I don't know why this fish took three hours, to land, well, you never put any pressure on them. You never got up close. You never closed that gap. You never stopped the boat and let the fish pull the boat. You know, mm -hmm. just just things like that. Yeah. As as a new guy, you know, me and Hunter coming in, we chased tarpon last year was our first year. Um, what is one thing or a few things you would tell a new guy coming in looking for tarpon with a fly rod to kind of just – help his success. I mean, it's, it is a lot of hard, you know, it's going to be hard work and we're, we're putting in the time and learning, but what's something that you could think might give us, get or give a new tarpon angler an edge? You know, t time on the water is, you, you can't recreate that any other way. You mm -hmm. know, time on the water is time on the water. Um, one, one thing that I, that I do say, is see, uh, in modern guides, or guides that are coming up is in the old days, if a, when, when I was learning I and mean, when I was a young guide and I saw other, other people fishing, I, they look like a dot on the horizon and they never, 
I never allowed myself to make them appear any bigger, meaning I never got close enough to know who they were mm-hmm. or, or see what they were doing. I was figuring out my own things. And then when I would run by that same spot another time and no one was there where I saw those other boats, I'd go in there and I would fish it. What I see a lot now, especially here in the Keys, are guides or anglers. It doesn't matter whether it's a guide or a weekend guy. Is they'll go and sit or, or run by somebody and they see them sitting there and the next day they go to that spot. They went to that spot because they saw that guy there. They don't know that spot intimately. The one, you cannot replace time with a push pole. You know, not, I don't know if you've ever heard of Nine Mile Bank. It's out here in Florida Bay. It's a, it's a, it's a flat that's literally nine miles long and it has big points that stick out. I learned Nine Mile Bank by pulling it. Not by watching where other guides mm-hmm. sat on it. So I understood the movement of the fish. I understood that when they cross this channel and they hop up on this edge, they act different than they did the, the rest of the flat. Those are things that, that make a difference in learning the fish, learning their habits, learning where they travel and where they bite better mm-hmm. in these certain situations. Out on the ocean side, you know, you're fishing down these big strips of white sand where there's not a lot of current, like the Matacombe Beach, you know, for example. It's a very known tarpon spot. Everybody just lines up and fish come by. You can see them coming forever. If you were in a Walmart parking lot and you walk out during the place is just loaded with cars. Everything's busy. You know, you don't notice everything about that parking lot. You don't notice what's around you because it's just such busyness. You go out there at two in the morning and you're, you're the only car there. You notice everything between the door of that Walmart to your car. You notice everything around your surroundings. On a, on a beach that's just sandy bottom and those tarpon are swimming, they notice everything around them. There's, there's not a lot of current. There's not sea fans. There's not grass floating out of a channel in this heavy current. So they're very aware of their surroundings in that setting. So you take those same fish that just went down Matacombe Beach and you go to a flat closer to a channel that has big sea fans and a lot of current and the fish are having to fight the current and all these sea fans are waving in the current and the grass is flowing over out of this channel. They don't notice your awareness as much. So, th- you know, those little, those are little things that can lead to, to success when you, when you, but the way I learned all those things was with my push pole. So it goes right back to that. You're not the first person to tell us that. Yeah. That's a, you're going to learn more with a push pole and by out there fishing, you know, the GPS time, I learned how to fish and how to run around these places before GPS was around. And I think guys just rely so much on a spot. Mm. You know, there's, there's, there, it brings up a, another point. There's been a, a particular spot. We won't get into a big discussion on it, but there's been a particular spot here in the Keys that's been outlawed in tournaments because me and a couple other guides fish there daily. You know, not I might not be there every day, but one of the three of us or two of the three of us are there daily. And other guides feel like they don't want to encroach on that area because we're veteran guides and, We've been known to run people out of there and things like that. It has nothing to do with the spot. The reason we, we, we are, are protective of that spot is because we learned it with a push pole. We learned every ounce of that bottom, you know, that's a mile and a half long by spending time there. And everybody else that goes there and fishes it, fishes it a little different than we do. And it, and it screws it up if you're behind them because we're not fishing it right. Mm-hmm. We learn that if I sit here and this guy sits there and that other guy sits there, we all three will get great shots and we'll all three catch fish. So be, beyond understanding the fish and, and, you know, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but y- you'll learn a lot more about the fish by just polling and observing and taking it all in and watch the fish, how they react and different types of bottom in different situations than just running to a spot and trying to figure out that. D- does that make sense? Oh, yes, sir. And that's, uh, you know, we've we've run into that this past year, you know, with we know some guides that are in our, in our area. We fish that area a pretty 
long time, just not for tarpon. So mm-hmm. we kind of going in last year, we knew, you know, we knew kind of where to start looking, but it wasn't like a, okay, you need to set up here on this spot, you know, yeah. not 20 feet there, 20 right. feet in front of there. So I kind of actually, I had a situation last year. I was, you know, I like to get up early and just, I, I think that's from duck hunting. Just, I want to be the first person there. So. Sure. So I'm there and here come two guys, uh, you know, and they kind of, I'm where they're headed, you know, and they set up, you know, they're probably 20 yards behind me and I see him kind of push back a little bit more. So I, you know, pull my anchor up, pull over. Hey man, you know, I'm, this is my first year I'm learning, you know, don't let me get in your way. You guys are making this, you're making your living this way. I'm just trying to learn how to tarpon fish, you know, don't let me get in your way. Where do you want me? And Hey man, you know, slide back right here. Everything's cool. We're all going to have a great day. Yeah. And we did. It was a great day. You right. know, everybody saw fish, everybody hooked fish. And uh I think that's kind of the message we're trying to get to the guys coming in or at least the younger guys. I mean, you sh- you come up and you know kind of pay them some respect, you know. Don't act like you're entitled to anything because you're not. I that's mean, right. It is the ocean, you know, you can fish wherever you want, but you're not entitled. These guys have been working yeah. working their butts off for years learning this stuff. And just try to take it slow and be humble about it and I think everybody will This is uh for the most part treat you the same. You know, fly fishing, especially for tarpon, but just fishing in general, you earn your stripes. You and and you treat other guys on the water the way you want to be treated. And if you never lose that mindset, you know, for the most part, I think you're going to be embraced by veterans that see you out there often. And if you're respectful to them every time they see you, and you you know you do the right thing and you're always cautious to not to make sure you're not disturbing their day. They're going to share things with you. Your your knowledge is going to grow, and that's what happened with me. Going back to when I fished that first tarpon tournament here, the the veteran guides here. It didn't take long before I became part of their little clique because of the way I treated them on the water with respect, and I did not ever want to interfere with them. I I, I learned my own stuff. I didn't interfere with their daily routines. I've, I've, I created my own, and and that went a long way. My dad's a captain, and I grew up with him always telling me all the time, you know, a full cup can't take any water, yeah, you know. Right. And the other side of that is nobody wants to pour into a full cup. No veteran sees a guy who thinks that he knows everything and says, you know what, I would, I'd love to help show this guy something a little different about this approach. Or mm-hmm. I see that his, his leaders set up this way. He could, you know, and, and that's just one of the things that that's where this podcast was birthed from was a desire to meet veterans and meet different captains and learn from them and create this, this podcast where people who aren't full cups yeah. will come sure. and learn. And Absolutely. That goes back to what you said earlier, which was you're always learning. And, uh, I, I can tell that's a, that's an important part of a lot of great guides. And I, I think that's the difference in, in a great guide and a good guide. Mm-hmm. You know, there are lots of good guides. A guide that goes out every day and he puts his people on fish and to some, as, you know, to, to some point he can teach that angler how to catch those fish. But it's, he, he may be to that point in his career that he's a little burned out. He, he doesn't have that drive anymore to want to wanna keep learning, to, to keep getting better at what he does. And a great guide never reaches that point. He sets a goal, and he, and he reaches that goal, and then he sets a new one. And he reaches that goal, and he sets a new one. It's this never-ending thing. And you know in the back of your mind, you're never going to be satisfied. And I, and I think that's just a different in personalities. You either have that or you don't. Earlier, just to go back to something, you talked about being in good shape and having good fitness and how that factors into being a guide and whether you're on a – pulling platform you're trying to set somebody up on a fish or there's an aspect too of longevity and absolutely just, absolutely t- tell us a little bit about your approach to the fitness aspect you know i start every day whether i'm fishing or not at the gym if i'm fishing i'm there at 4 30 if i gotta meet my guy at 6 30 i'm at the gym at 4 30 i'm done by quarter to six i eat breakfast and go meet my guy it's just it's it's kind of it's my anchor you know it's it's it, i always feel like I put pressure on myself that I have this wall behind me and there, there is no going backwards. There's only one direction I can go if this wall is always behind me and that's forward. And the gym for me, as much physical as it, as it does help me physically, it's mental as well. I, I wake up every morning to, to do that when you're fishing 40, 50 days in a row and you go to the gym 
40 out of those 50 days when you're getting ready to go pole all day. I mean, it, it takes a, a certain mindset, you know, to be able to do that. But the days I don't go to the gym, I don't feel right the whole day. So it, it's more of a, I've had a total pec re, reattachment. I've had seven shoulder surgeries, ankle surgery, dislocated both thumbs, an, you know, spinal fusion. Mm. There is no way that I could fish the way I do, as hard as I do, if I didn't train. And I see guys, you know, old veteran guides that are that are still great guides, and I'm not taking anything away from them. But you know, they they come in and they go drink a beer at the bar and they go home and they do the same thing the next day and they're limping and they can't pull like they used to. They don't have the balance that they they once had. So there's no way that that can affect the ending outcome of what they caught that day. They can't, they just can't get the boat in position that many times. You know, it's, it's a game of, of odds when I don't, when I can pull all day long and get the boat in front of every school of tarpon that went by the boat and give my angler that it, it it's a numbers game. Mm -hmm. And and I will honestly say that in tournaments that, that has been the difference in me winning or losing sometimes is I gave my angler in, in a five day period, 80 more shots than any other angler. Not that I was seeing more fish. I was able to get to the more position. fish. Right. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. And give us a little taste of the, the Rob workout plan. What's that regimen look like as you try to, obviously you love working out, but you're intentional with it too. And you're probably doing certain things physically with your sport fishing in mind. Yeah. What does that look like? You know, I, I don't do actually sp specific, uh, movements that are, that are fishing specific other than I don't like, I don't use, um, wrist straps because I, I deal with pretty big weights most guys use wrist straps so they don't I want my grip to be strong so one I can grip the push pole harder but when a tarpon comes by the boat and it's time to grab him the first time he comes by I'm gonna I'm gonna get his ass mm -hmm. you know because I have grip strength I never I never use straps I don't use a weight belt I just by by doing that you know I, I, I generally do a, a, a chest shoulders workout on a Monday the next day legs the next day back triceps the next day start over then a rest day or two you know depending on it, it would be no different than than uh a linebacker or mm -hmm. or, or somebody mm -hmm. that's that's trying to remain physically fit but yet agile at the same time uh but it's definitely made a difference in my career and it's definitely made a, a difference in my career at this point you know i'm almost 50 years old being able to, to stand up and, and out pull most, most guides makes a difference when, it, when tournament time comes. I could definitely see that with the grip. It's funny, we talk about from the tarpon guide standpoint, you're looking and you said there's some certain marks and you'll say, man, I've seen that tarpon before. You're wondering too if those tarpon get pulled up to the boat and look up and go, oh no. <laughs> that, that dude's gonna get me the first grip. maybe they prefer it's that maybe they say dude to, in today's world with with you know the kill gaff gone i think they might just go just let's just go ahead and get this over with at this point right right <laughs> but uh well we also wanted to talk a little bit too about obviously the new show sea hunter mm -hmm. and it's it's a it's a really neat show that you you know as we hang out in the keys a lot of times when when people are talking about you they're they're saying man he's the the tarpon guy you know you're tied but with the new show it's more well-rounded and more uh you know kind of out looking at different species where yeah. did that desire come from and and what's the kind of thought process behind that well you know w when i got the desire to to do a fishing show uh i, I didn't want it to to relic any any other i didn't want it to just be a fishing show you know i wanted to be able to take the viewer by the hand and take them, on, take them on an experience. You know, by the end of it, I wanted them to feel like they were on the same adventure I was on. And there's there's not a lot of fishing shows even today. There's there's some, you know, it's, TV's getting better, but there haven't been many shows over the years that weren't just, oh, we're, we're, we're here, we're Captain So-and-So today, and we're gonna go catch walleye, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not excited already, <laughs> <laughs> you know? For multiple reasons. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> So I didn't want it to, to resemble anything like that. What got me interested in doing it, uh, I, I actually was the camera boat for the pilot for the Walker's K Chronicles. Huh. 
So before the Walker's Chronicles existed, the way any TV show becomes to existence is you make a pilot and you, you send it to sponsors or send it to a network and see if it's something that they're interested in. So the first pilot for the Walker's Chronicles, I was a camera boat over the years. I was a camera boat for a lot of those episodes as well as co-hosted with Flip. So I saw how it all worked. You know, I kind of understand. I mean, that, that's the pinnacle mm -hmm. of any fishing show that's ever been, in my opinion, was that show. And Flip did it well. But again, it goes back to he took the viewer by a hand and took him on a ride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a fishing show. <clears throat> Fish just happened to be part of it. I was, my, one of my best friends, lifelong best friends, was Jose Wahebe. And filmed many shows with him, spent a lot of time with him. The unique thing about when, whenever he and I would do TV together, and we'd always comment on it, it was no different than when he and I went fishing for fun. We, we kind of forgot that they were there. Mm -hmm. We forgot there was a camera boat there. We forgot that there were these guys holding these things, pointing at us. We had fun. And, and it came across in the show. Mm -hmm. The year that Jose passed, um, he called me. He was loading his plane. We, we had, he had made the decision that he no longer wanted to host his show. And he wanted to produce. He, he wanted to get into that side of it. It was like a new, a new goal, a new whatever. You know, he, he didn't want to be the guy in front of the camera anymore. He wanted his vision to come out on the television, which he didn't feel like at the time his show was. And he asked me to host it. He was going to produce it. I was going to host it. So he calls me the day he was loading his plane and said, hey, you know, I'll see you next week. We had some meetings with the network and so forth, so on. And then 10 minutes later, one of his camera guys called me and you know, said his, his plane had crashed and Jose was no longer with us. Still miss him every day. But the fact that he, I never thought of having a TV show. I, I, I didn't, I thought it was cool. It was neat to be a part of all those, those shows over the years, but I didn't dream of doing that. But the fact that he felt like I was good enough and had it enough to, to host his show, replace him in front of the camera. Then, then I said, you know what, if he felt that strongly that, that maybe this is something I need to, to try. And that's what really got the bug for me to, to do it. And what's the, the kind of angle on trying to just kind of broaden the, the types of fish targeted? I, I think I, I, I kind of base that on, on my fishing career, you know, my lifelong fishing career, not my professional career. Hmm. I, I love to chase everything. Obviously, I have this deep passion for tarpon. But a tarpon show, after a while, you know, there is a tarpon show. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to because mm -hmm. that's a great show and it's shot well and it's well done. How many how many tarpon fishermen are there in the world? Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's very, very small percentage. There's more trout fishermen than there are tarpon fishermen, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not that I, I want to go do a trout show, but I just wanted to I, I want my experiences of the of the sea. And that's where the sea hunter name came from mm -hmm. was. You know, I've had some of the coolest experiences I've ever had on the water, ever. Sail fishing or deep dropping or back in the Everglades, you know, you see a python go by and then you catch a 10, 12 pound snook that was in inches of water. All of those things have this cool factor yeah. that are beyond just tarpon. Tarpon is my favorite fish. Tomorrow, if, if it was my last day to fish, I'd be right here in Alamorada fly fishing for tarpon. But I love to fish for everything and I think I think people like seeing all those different aspects of the sea. Oh yeah. So that, that, that's the whole idea behind the show. Again, it, it is a fishing show, but it's more than that. It's more about it, this cool adventure. Mm -hmm. What, what's your second favorite fish to target? Hmm. Good question. That's a tough one. Um, it kind of be a, a, a toss up between snook and permit. Okay. I love them both, you know, permit or permit. And that's what's the, the, you know, they intrigue me because they're a pain in the ass sometimes. Mm -hmm. They're not easy. Snook, I, I love, I love, what I love about snook is not just the fish, but the environment that mm -hmm. you catch them in. Where, the environment I catch them in. You know, you can go out to an inlet and throw a mullet out and catch a giant snook. That's not the element I'm talking about. Back in the Everglades, you leave the dock and you don't see a boat till you come back to the dock. 
mangroves. The country is the way God built it. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's, that's what's cool about snook fishing to me. But having said that, every time I go catch a sailfish and, and watch them tail walk 50 yards, you know, and never, <laughs> and never get back in the, in the water, it, it's pretty badass it's too. Be incredible. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, well, with the, with the show, I, I feel like it's, it's got a great kind of tone to it. There's a, it, there's a fun aspect with it too, that I think I, I grew up playing sports and I think that the, there's a, you know, you talk about being an athlete, but there's this kind of fun sense of athleticism with the whole thing. It's Absolutely. got that kind of sport competitor vibe to it or yeah. brand. Um, but is there a, a, a larger message too that you are trying to get out to the next generation of anglers? You know, there's, there's obvious the, the drive behind me and it doesn't matter what like tarpon fishing or sail fishing, I want to be good at it. You know, I'm not happy unless I feel like I understand this game and, and every day I go out, I'm learning things, but the, the real, the real deal by the end of the day, regardless of what species you're chasing and what you're doing or where you're at is, you know, life is short. You know, we don't have a long time. It, It seems like you guys, your age, Seems like years go by pretty slow, but the older you get, you're going to see how fast they start going. And the experiences that, that you share with people are, they're unaffected by, by normal day life. You know, when you drive to work every day, there are so many distractions and you get a guy gets behind his office chair and his boss is barking in his ear. You got to get this done and just getting to work all the horns and there's all this BS when you're on the water with somebody, it's you, them, unaffected by life. You're just taking all this in. You see dolphins in their natural habitat. You, you, throw, a, you throw a cast to a, a topwater plug to a snook and you watch him blow up on it and he missed it and you didn't catch him, but that's one of the coolest damn things you've ever seen. And you're sharing that experience together that, that you can't replace in normal life. N- nothing replaces those experiences because there's nothing, there's no distractions. And I think it's, it's, it kind of bothers me today with kids, you know, young youth that, that more than 50% of their life is spent on these games, you know, mm-hmm. and, and on computers and they're just looking down. They're missing out on, on so much that, that life has to offer that they can do for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not going to play whatever the new game is, you know, yeah. when they, when they turn 25. Just think of what, what, what he could be doing if, if, if his dad or his uncle or, or a friend took that kid out fishing. Hmm. It could change that kid's life forever. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's one message that recently I've, I've, I've tried to, to get out there is we, we need to get kids involved because if you looked at the statistics, kids are not, they're not even at, they're not even at the little league parks like they used to mm-hmm. be. You know, all of that's kind of fading away. And I, and I think it's modernization that's making it fade away. You leave here, you go fishing. It's no different than guys when they, the, the, the tools are different. The boats are different. The rods and reels are different, but the experience is the same as it was a hundred years ago today. So that's good. As we kind of close out, are there any closing thoughts or upcoming things that you're excited about with the show or any projects you're doing? You know, one thing with the show, this is its fourth season, you know, what we're shooting now and what just started airing, um, it's all for me, it's all about the vision and, and taking, you know, uh, the viewer on a ride. I, I, it's a learning curve like anything else. And this year, this season ha- has taken on the real feeling that I want the show to have. It's, 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 it's the foundation of what I've, I've built my fishing life around and it's, and it's conveyed through the production work. Hmm. You know, I've made some changes there and, and it's really coming to life. And it seems like it's being accepted well because I've getting a lot of comments about it, you know, on, on social media and stuff. So that I'm excited about. I'm also excited that my, my daughter and my son, you know, we, we've made it a point to, to spend more time on the water together. My daughter's gotten really big into fly fishing. I'm excited about that. Awesome. Yeah. So all of those things, uh, are pretty exciting. 
and I've and I've teamed up with uh, Project Healing Waters, hmm. and I'm I'm starting to do a lot more with vets, you know, wounded vets, mm-hmm. whether it be a PTSD situation or actually a, a physical situation. That Project Healing Waters uses fishing as, as a method for these these individuals to to heal. You know, they teach them how to tie flies and teach them how to build rods, and then use these tools in the outdoors to get them back on you know normal civilian life and be able to keep the bad bad times away. Wow. And it's pretty cool to That's be a great. part of that and meet, meet some of America's heroes. You know, I love that. Well, thank you so much for being generous and sitting down with us and giving us some time. Yeah. Really grateful for it. Awesome time talking fishing with you. Thank you. Enjoyed it as well. Thank, thank you guys for having me. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Not much to say after that, except please continue to share and show your support. Let us know if you have any suggestions on topics or potential guests. We want this to be a community project and would love to hear from you. Thanks for the support. This is the Captain's Collective.